one dedicated person. <gasps> you just reminded me. I have not put a thing up on Facebook, have I? So you can't comment. You have not made a comment on. So this is the YouTube version of this week's lesson, which doesn't have any comments on. But I'll put a post on Facebook as usual. So if you would like to say hello, and you've got a Facebook account, then you can jump over and say hello. Or post a picture of yourself making a mess, or a picture of your cat, well, you know, whatever you don't like to send me. I love it. Right, um, YouTube, Ammonite YouTube lesson live now. Um, Put any comments slash cat photos below. I better do that that hand pointing downwards so that people know what below means. You've got to add an emoji, haven't you? Uh, what's the background for an ammonite? They haven't got any ammonite backgrounds. I could do a basketballs, so they're round. Or a fern, because they were around in the Jurassic period the same time as ammonites. Yeah, let's go fern. People will get that, won't they? There we go. There. Thanks for reminding me, one person watching. Oh, there's three people watching now, hello. Still quite early, isn't it? She says, hopefully. I've got to draw a picture of an ammonite. Right. Stop distracting me, you lot. <laughs> Stop distracting me with your number so that I know you're there. I've got to concentrate. I've got to, I've got to draw a picture of an ammonite. Oh no, I'm so sorry, this is going to wobble a bit. You're sitting on a poster that I need to read in. Yeah, that's okay. Oh, wait, wait. It's really confusing because on Facebook, generally speaking, um, I don't flip the screen, which means that the writing has to be backwards. But YouTube automatically... Um, flips it. So now everything that was backwards now has to be printed forwards. It's just the, the fun of online teaching. Oh thank you, I see someone has taken the time to like this. That, that's good of you. That will please YouTube. should be singing. Ever since we've been doing the rock cycle lessons I've had a song in my head and I've never told you about it but we've been learning about uh, weathering yeah and teeny tiny little bits of rock breaking off big rocks and I've told you that that is called sediment. Little bits of rock is, is called sediment. Have you heard of a musical called The Pirates of Benzant? It's fantastic. Oh it's great. It's about, um, oh goodness me, well it's just, I don't know what's it about, it's just a load of nonsense. It's about a person who accidentally becomes a pirate and his adventures. And there's some policemen in it, I don't know why, and they've got this song, um, and the, the sort of chorus of the song goes, Yes, it's very evident, these intentions are well meant. Evident, 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 ah yes, well meant. And literally the entire time I've been teaching, this is the fourth rock cycle lesson. And the, the whole lesson, every single previous time, 
I might have sounded like I was saying interesting science things, but all my head's been doing is going, it's very sediment, these intentions are well meant, sediment, sediment, so now you know. You're the first people I've told that to. Okay, putting up the little sign again that is now the right way around. Apologies if I wiggle you. Oh, come on, a new coffee member. Oh, what a lovely way to start a lesson. So if you don't know, you seven people, the odds are that you do know. But if you don't know, then the reason that I do, how I do all my lessons live and for free and print outs for free and things is because a lot of people are supporting me on this website called Coffee. They send me, I don't know, like five or six quid a month, generally. Some people send more. And I send them um, a magazine and rainbow glasses to say thanks and my eternal gratitude because this is the best job ever. No offence if there's any adult in the room that has a different job, but this is the best one. Okay, what time is it? Oh, come on, what, four minutes? Right, I've done my background, that was a big thing. Oh, I've got to find those two labels. Oh, there they are. Oh no, there's one. Oh, let's go scenario. Hello. It's okay, you can come in, they can't see you. I've got my microphone. for me. <laughs> okay. Mm. A little bit sticking. Okay. When a foreman bears a shield to run to run to run to run, we uncomfortable feel to run to run. But perhaps it would be wise. Not the fool more criticise, because it's very evident these intentions are well meant. Yes, it's very evident. Oh no! Oh, I fell at the last hurdle. My little fossils are the wrong way around. Oh, do I bother to print it off? Yeah, I think so. Um. No, I don't think I do have to. Okay, shut in the office door. Um, cutting out these little pieces of ammonites. How are we doing for time? Ah, oh, 60 seconds. Thank you, six people who've liked this. Thank you very much. Come on others, fall in line. Get, get liking it and maybe, I mean, it's fair enough, isn't it? It's like paying for food before it arrives. My dad never does that. My dad will never go to any cafe and they all do it now, like any pub, where you have to pay for the food before it comes. It's like, well, what if it's no good? So maybe you're just waiting and thinking, well, I'll like this after I've jolly well seen it. Thank you, Lara. It might be rubbish. Right. Okay, just to keep you posted, you lot. I am putting three little bits of sellotape onto the things and then I'm going to draw a very fast ammonite on the board and then
then we'll get started. So if you really need a wee or a glass of water, you can go now, but you have to go right now. Don't, don't need those. Need that one. You can go in there. And yeah, need that one. And you need this one. There. Right. I'm in the drawer in time. Must remember to write the right way around. Just make sure it doesn't slip. There we go. There we go. Right. Sorry about that, folks. Okay. <clears throat> the nose is getting blown, and then I'm going to flip you. Ah, marvellous. All right, you lot. Thank you for being so patient. Oh, there's more of you here now. See, that's good. That's the plan. Okay, I'm flipping you. I'm gonna flip you right now. You ready? We're flipping. We're doing this. Mm. Ah, hello! Get that in the back. There we go. Hello, everybody. Hello. My name is Lara. This is Theory of Science. It's the Rock Cycle Lesson Four. But don't worry about the other lessons. This one is it's probably the best one. It's probably the most interesting one for most of us. It's on ammonites. So we've looked at weathering. Uh, we'll talk about that in a sec. I'll catch you up if you if you're new. Last week we looked at how fossils are actually formed. This week it's all about ammonites. Why are they so special? Why are they incredibly useful to geologists and scientists? Right. <clears throat> uh, first question. I'm going to show you a, a bit generous to call it a diagram, but I drew this picture, right, of an ammonite. Um, first question. Which bit of this ammonite do we not know for sure existed? Which bit of this ammonite do we not know for sure existed? Hmm? There's no comments, so you can't answer. I'm going to give you five seconds. Which bit? I've labelled these suitor lines because we, we're going to talk about those later on. They're quite important. Uh, which bit? Three, two, one. Well, if you came to last week's lesson, that was a big clue. The soft part. We've never found the tentacles of an ammonite. They just don't get fossilised. We looked at last week how hard parts, uh, if anything gets fossilised, it's usually the hard part. So shells, bones, they've got little holes in them, minerals get into the holes, and then when the shell or the bone like sort of disintegrates or dissolves, then the minerals are left and we get a fossil. But soft parts, they generally decay, don't they? They get eaten or they rot away. So this bit is all kind of just scientists assuming, actually. Um, I've put, yeah, these suitor lines on. They're the only bit I'm going to label because they're important when it comes to telling the difference between different ammonites, which we will do later. But the last thing I'd like to ask you before we get to our activity is, what does this ammonite shell have in common with your face? 
What does this ammonite shell have in common with your face? Put your hands on your face, if they're clean. Give it a little squidge, be gentle, explore. Might be bits of your face you've never really thought about before. Which, which bit of your face is also a bit of this ammonite shell? It's a good question, isn't it? Three seconds, I don't know. Three, two, one. It is uh, your septum. Do you know which bit that is? I'm gonna try not to be too gross, but it's the bit between your nostrils. It's effectively the bit that makes your nostrils, the septum. Is that, just put your hands on your knees, don't be poking around in there, but it's this bit between your nose is called your septum. And ammonites have got loads of them. Not many people know this. It's a great ammonite fact, is that when an ammonite was first born, it had a teeny tiny little shell and it just lived in this tiny little bit of shell, this bit in the middle. And then as the ammonite grew, it grew new shell and it sealed off the old shell with this, with a little bit of stuff, like a septum, we call it. And then it lived in the next bit of shell. And then as it got bigger, it sealed off that bit of shell. So there's another septum there and it lived in that bit and it continued. So it's really weird to think that a fully grown ammonite was only actually living in the last section of its shell. And the whole rest of the shell, it was very useful because it had uh, air in it, which could be compressed or expanded and that helped made the ammonite go up or down in the water. Oh, good, hey. Um, so the suit, the septum, the scepter are inside the shell and the suitor lines, they weren't actually visible when the ammonite was alive, but the suitor lines on your fossil, they show you a kind of where the scepter inside the shell would have met the outside of the shell. All right. Let's do our activities. We're going to talk now about why ammonites are so incredibly uh, useful. So, <clears throat> what I'd like you to do, please, is get a piece of A4 paper, if you have one, and a pair of scissors. Now, I'm horrible at explaining crafty things, but this is, this is easy. You just fold the piece of paper three times so that you, you, get, you mark out eight little pieces of paper. I just can't work out how to describe it. Just fold it in half once and then again and then again and then unfold it again and you'll have eight creases. Is that what I'm looking for? The creases will have divided your paper into eight. Yeah, it took three lessons, but I think I've got there. It doesn't matter if they're not exactly the same size and it doesn't matter which way you do the folds. So the last three, the last few lessons, um, we've been talking about weathering. So imagine a rock high up on a hill or a mountain, okay? That rock, it gets rained on, uh, maybe tree roots grow into the rock, animals bury around it, acid rain falls on it. And eventually we say that that rock gets like weathered, little bits break off or eroded, little bits break off and then travel away. Those, right, you, got, you done that? You see that it's folded three times. So it's divided into eight now. Now what I want you to do is to just cut along the creases so that you've got eight small pieces of paper, yeah? Um, so those teeny, tiny, teeny, tiny, teeny little bits of rock that break off the big rock, they are, we call that sediment. And sediment can be quite big, like a pebble-sized bit of rock could break off, or sediment can be small, like sand is just sediment, little bits of rock that are about two millimetres big. Or it could be really teeny, tiny bits of uh, sediment, which we, we generally call clay or silt. Um, but that sediment, it gets carried away like by maybe a river or a uh, wind, if it was in the desert or something. And eventually that sediment gets laid down somewhere and more sediment goes on top and more sediment goes on top of that and more and more and more and more. Eventually over tens of thousands or millions of years, the sediment from above pushes down on the sediment below and it forms rock. That rock is called sedimentary rock. Kind of, we're on lesson four of the rock cycle and we've only learned about that one kind of rock, sedimentary rock. We will, next week, we're going to learn about the kind of rocks formed uh, in volcanoes and things. But if you find fossils in rock, it must be sedimentary rock, okay? Fossils only form in sedimentary rock, just sediment getting laid up and laid up and then little animal dying and sort of getting trapped in the middle and eventually compressed. So any fossil you find, that's in sedimentary rock. Next week, yeah, we look at like lava and stuff. But obviously, a, a creature isn't isn't going like a creature's bones aren't going to survive in lava. Okay. Oh, I have eight small pieces of paper. If you have eight small pieces of paper in front of you, here's what I'd like you to do. Might seem a bit strange, and nothing to do with ammonites, 
bear with me. What I want you to do with your eight pieces of paper are make um, two piles of four, right? In the end, what I want you to do is just have two piles of four next to each other. But how I want you to do it is I'd like you to spread your paper out on the table or the carpet or whatever in front of you. Spread your eight tiny pieces of paper out. And then without looking, re sort of without looking, don't like put your hand on the scissors, but reach down and get two pieces of paper and put them in front of you without looking. And then get two more pieces of paper and put those in front of you without looking on top of the other piece of paper, okay? So you've made, you're making two piles of paper. And just do that a few more times. There we go. There. So now we have two piles of paper. It's just like a model, you see? These are like rock layers building up and up. That's what we've done here. Okay, question. It's gonna sound like I'm taking the mic. I'm not, genuine question. Um, look at your piles now. Which pieces of paper did you put down first? Which two pieces of paper did you put down first? Genuine question. I'm not gonna take too long on this. It, you're probably screaming, the bottom layers. We put the bottom ones down first. Yes, keep your piles, we'll need those in a sec. Well, this might seem very obvious to you and me, but um, you've actually discovered by accident a very important law of geology. This is where I sort of start smiling because I'm a physics specialist and in, in physics, the laws are sort of really complicated and mathsy. This is a, a big important law of geology. A law is sort of a, a general rule that scientists have worked out that helps us understand the world. It's called the law of superposition. Superposition. The law of superposition is, if you're looking at a cliff face, with loads and loads of different layers of rock in it, the rocks at the bottom were put down first. The rocks at the bottom are the oldest. The law of superposition, if you want. The rocks at the top are the youngest. There you go. Someone did have to think about that and discover that. So as the sediment was lying down, obviously this sediment at the bottom got there first and piled up and up and over time. And the one at the top was, was put down last. The law of superposition, remember it, comes up at Geology GCSE. Right, have you got your two piles again? Let's have a little quick look at why it's not always that simple. Did you know that the earth is on plates? Did you know that? If you didn't, then I'm so happy that I get to break this to you. The, the Earth's crust is not one impenetrable like layer of chocolate on a Malteser. It's broken up into bits, kind of like massive paving slabs. And these massive paving slabs move around and they bash into each other. And then when they bash into each other, sometimes both of them go up like that. Sometimes one goes up and, and one go down. This is when you get like volcanoes and earthquakes. So get your two parts of paper again, please. We will pretend that your two little piles of paper are uh, two tectonic plates, two of these massive paving stones moving around. So put them, put them lengthways, I'm holding them so that they're, I'm holding the edges and the lengths are stretching out in front of me. Put them down on the table or whatever, hold them at the ends and push them together and see what happens. <gasps> Look, I'm so pleased with this. I made this up, you know. Look, this is what happens. The earth is folding. Some bits are going down. Some bits are going, oh no, it's chaos. Oh, so just keep folding until they all kind of lie down. Oh no, now which one did you lay down first? You've got no idea. So this is where, um, I'm not gonna make you do it, but what would have been useful is if you numbered the layers, wouldn't it? If you had two piles and you'd labeled them one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and then you'd push them together, then it wouldn't matter how they were organized. You'd always, when you found them, like 10 years later under a desk somewhere, you'd be like, oh yeah, that was the third one I put down. This is kind of what ammonites are doing in the ground. We got there. Ammonites are what we call very good index fossils. They existed for a very long period of time. They existed for like well over a hundred million years and they evolved very fast. So they kept changing, right? So they evolved very quickly. So they all, so like the rock, the ammonites in one layer of rock will look totally different to the ammonites in another layer of rock. That's maybe only like 200,000 years difference. But the, because the ammonite existed for millions of years, um, if you found a certain kind of ammonite in a rock, 
now you know, okay, the rock must be sort of that, that old. So we call fossils that are, that are good at aging rock, index fossils. I'm not gonna tell you any more about them. I've already said too much. I've made you a sheet and I'd like you to work out the sort of puzzled questions on it. And, and I think you'll understand what index fossils are. So come with me. Oh no, I accidentally showed you my amazing Mary Anning t-shirt. The Mary Anning website, they're a charity that are putting up a statue in Lyme Regis for famous paleontologist uh, Mary Anning. You should, you should go and get one of the t-shirts, they're cool. Right, here we are. So, <clears throat> index fossils are used to date layers of rock. Work out the ages of the layers below. I thought this was going to be fun because it's got like cartoons in it and this puzzle. It's actually quite hard, this. So you've got five layers of rock here that I've labelled A, B, C, D and E. All the layers are different ages, first of all. Don't forget that. They're all different ages. Um, and they can't, they can't be half ages. So it's just it's maybe one of them is one million years old or three million years old. We're not going to say one's one and a half million years old. Um, and the, these layers haven't been disturbed by earthquakes since they formed. So they're in the order that they were laid down. I've, I don't want to confuse you, but I thought this was a good time to introduce this. M-A in geology means mega annum. It's just a really quick, nice way of writing million years. So I've drawn a little shell. I haven't drawn it. I've got a little shell here and I've put lived two to nine M-A ago. So this little shell lived between two and nine million years ago. OK, and there's different fossils in the layers and using the fossils, you have to work out how old each layer is. So there's a shell in layer A and there's also a dragonfly, which it says here lived two million years ago. So this dragonfly must have like gone extinct one million years ago and not evolved three million years ago. So it only lived two million years ago. The dates are massively simplified. They're totally made up. Um, this ammonite lived two to four million years ago. That's in layer B. This trilobite lived four to seven million years ago. That's also in layer B. This little worm, I think we decided in yesterday's lesson that his name was... Uh, Wormicus the Great, Wormy, uh, Theatre of Science's mascot, Wormy's long lost ancestor, lived exactly six million years ago. This spiky ammonite, some of them did have spikes, like defensive spines, lived between eight and nine million years ago. Uh, that's in layer E, just below Wormy. And this, I was sad to find yesterday, it's not called a squid carrot, it's a cone squid, lived one to eight million years ago. And that's in the bottom layer as well. Question two, which was the least useful fossil in question one and why? Which one in question one did you not really use to work out the dates of the fossils? And question three, what makes a living thing a good index fossil? So can you circle or note down the five correct answers? I got this really wrong in the first lesson. Um, and I think there should be another one there that I haven't written. But I've kept it the same because if you've got the printout from my Facebook page, then it would be confusing to change it. And also it's quite good to talk about mistakes. We do learn from mistakes. Right, I'm now going to be silent for as long as I can manage. Probably about 40 seconds while I check Facebook to see if any of you have left me any comments. And drink some coffee. I tell you what, I'll go through the, the answer to question, the first one in question one, because some people yesterday weren't getting it at all. And I don't want you to just sit there thinking, if you understood it, if you explained it again, I could do it, but I can't do it because I don't understand. So layer number one, how do we work out how old that one is? Well, we've got a little shell in layer one and the shell lived between two and nine million years ago. So that means that layer of rock A, it must be two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or nine million years old, because there's a shell in it. So that's pretty vague, isn't it? Uh, but there's also a little fossilised dragonfly in there, and the dragonfly only lived two million years ago. So if there's a dragonfly fossilised in the rock, then the rock must be two million years old, because otherwise the dragonfly wouldn't have existed. You see what I mean? So layer A is two million years old. Some comments. Oh, hello, Luke and Palmer. Ah, Luke sent me a picture of a dog. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, I'll take that. Oh, what's it doing? Some sort of little stretchy. 
Oh, it's looking through a tube. God, so ridiculous. Thanks for that. What is it? Anyway. Seriously, where do you get that massive toilet roll? Oh, hello, Megan. And Marley's at scuba. Wow. Wow. Well, hello, Megan. I'm glad you're here. Uh, Jackie's just shouting, lava. Oh, well done. Oh, yeah. Jenny, you got it right. Cartilage. Yeah, that's exactly what the septum is. Yeah, cartilage. Tiger can't find the live one on YouTube. Oh, I should have put a link, shouldn't I? Oh, you found it on your mobile. Splendid. Hello, Tiger. The soft squid like part inside. Oh, Oscar, they are a is smashing it. Well done. Fantastic. Okay, should we go through some of these answers then? <clears throat> uh, I'll just have a nose blow while you're finishing off. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> right. So, uh, layer of rock number two. Well, um, there's a an ammonite in there that lived between two to four million years ago. Now, it can't be two million years because I said that they were not all the same age. They're all different ages. So it's three or four million years. But there's a trilobite next to it which lived four to seven million years ago. So layer B can't be three million years old because the trilobite didn't exist then, so it wouldn't be there. But it can't be seven million years old because... Uh, this ammonite didn't exist then. So it, layer B must be 4 million years old, okay? Layer C, ugh, we've only got this shell. So layer C, well, layer C must be older than 4 million years old because remember the law of superposition. You couldn't have a 2 million year old rock layer underneath a 4 million year old one. It's got to be older. Uh, so we better scooch by that for now. Ah! Layer D, here's Wormy. Wormy only lived six million years ago, so layer D must be six million years old, which means that layer C it must be five million years old, yeah? Because they're all different ages. That's the only option left. Uh, this little cone squid here, well, it lived one to eight million years ago, so layer E could be seven million years old or it could be eight million years old, uh, but we've got this ammonite here, which only lived eight million years ago and before that. So layer E must be 8 million years old, yeah? It can't be 7 because this ammonite wouldn't have been alive. So there are some ages of rock missing, but that's not entirely unlikely because did that, did that fox you? It might have done because I didn't explain. But 3 million years ago, maybe this part of the land was like a raging river and the raging river wore down into the rock and into the rock and into the rock until it carried all that layer of rock away. It's quite possible. So there must have been some sort of erosion happened maybe um, before, I don't know, the climate change and this area of land became an ocean maybe. Maybe this isn't mudstone where mudlet is not, is it? Can't be in an ocean, it's a dragonfly in it. Shush, now, Rick, come on, let's get on. Right, which is the least useful fossil and why? Well, hopefully you said the shell. And uh, the first lesson I was saying, oh, the shell, because it lived for too long, so it was too general it didn't you couldn't narrow down an age of rock using the shell but actually that's not that's not quite right really what i should have said was it lived a long time without changing would be a better more detailed answer lived long time should again i should probably say existed and not lived shouldn't i because it's not this one creature that lived for ages lived long time without changing i'll put because yeah, it, it's not evolved. Remember I said that the ammonites, they existed for a really long time, but they evolved really fast. So you can tell the difference between this rock and this rock because the ammonites look different. But if the shells all look the same, then it doesn't make them very useful. Okay, so the five correct answers. What makes a good index fossil? Well, there are lots of them. Uh, yeah, definitely. If you want to age rocks using fossils, then you want to be able to find the fossils, don't you? You want them to be as abundant as possible. That just means lots of them. So that, that's why the rare one was wrong. Um, rare's the opposite of lots of them. Lived on land? Uh, no, not necessarily. That wouldn't necessarily make a good index fossil. Most of the earth at the moment is ocean. And back in the day, even more of the land was ocean, if you know what I mean. More of planet Earth was ocean. So actually, most index fossils are marine creatures because they were spread over the world and also the oceans were all linked up. It's obviously much easier for an ammonite to get from one part of the world to the other than it is for a giraffe that's trapped on land. So living in different parts of the world, that is very useful for dating rocks. 
if I'm in England and you're in Africa and we want to compare our rocks and see if they're the same age, it really helps, doesn't it, if there's the same ammonite in your bit of rock and my bit of rock. That's good. Um, I'll skip that one for a minute. New to science? No, that would not be good. We need to know a lot about these index fossils for them to be useful. If they're new to science, we might not know when they existed or how they evolved, so you won't, you won't be able to use them. You need to know a lot about them. Hard parts easily fossilised? Yeah, that's good. That kind of comes back to them being abundant for the same reason you wouldn't want them to be fragile because then they'd easily break up and you wouldn't be able to find them. For the sort of the same reason again, you want them to be easy to recognise. If you want to date rocks with fossils, you just want there to be loads of them and for you to easily tell what they are and for the creature to have been fossilised in the first place. Um, yeah, and then I think I'll, I'll put myself on screen to talk about this bit because I existed for a long time or existed for a short time. Yeah, I'll turn you around. Wait. <coughs> So yeah, I made a mistake the first time I taught this. Quite an embarrassing error, actually. Because I was saying, oh, well, it'd be good if they existed for a short amount of time, because obviously, like, Wormy only existed for six million years. So it was dead easy to tell which rock was six million years old because Wormy was there. But obviously, actually, Wormy wouldn't be a very good index fossil. I mean, it's great if you only want to date rocks that are six million years old. But if you want to date any other kind of rock, uh, then Wormy's ancestor, they're not going to be very helpful. So it's, it's actually good if they existed for a long time. Like, Ammonites existed for ages, like I say, when I say 170 million years. Um, but they kept changing. So I really, if you've got the sheet or if you're making notes, can you add in um, evolved quickly? Evolved quickly or rapidly or fast. So you want the, the creature to have existed for a long time, but to have kept changing, yeah? You see what I mean? That's why the ammonite's very useful, but this shell isn't useful. That's why t one of the reasons why T-Rex skeletons are not good index fossils, because for one, T-Rex was only found in like Northwest America. Um, so it's no good if you want to date any fossil any other way else on the planet. Um, but also they existed, T-Rexes existed for about three million years, but they didn't change at all. So if you find a T-Rex in a fossil, you know that the rock is sort of three million years-ish old, but it doesn't pinpoint it very well. Whereas, like I say, ammonites changed so fast that obviously, like in geological time, if you're looking at a cliff, then the rocks in that cliff could be millions and millions and millions, sometimes even billions of years old. Um, and ammonites changed every kind of 200,000 years or so. So if you can find an ammonite in the rock, you're like, wow, I can pinpoint this rock to the closest 200,000 years. Pretty good, actually. Right, um, I'm just gonna do some teaching now. I don't often do that. It's kind of frowned upon in the classroom, certainly, when teachers just tell you stuff <laughs> without you actually having to do anything. But um, I wanna tell you a little bit about how ammonites evolved, because I think to understand things, it's really helpful to go kind of right back to the beginning. So you, you don't need to remember any of this. I'll tell you when we're getting to the stuff that I would like you to remember. But this is kind of just a story of how the Ammonites started. First of all, I'm gonna talk about how humans evolved because it's more easily relatable. So I don't know if you know this, but billions and billions, millions, billions of years ago, life on Earth began and it was just one thing. Just this kind of small, like one cell bacteria type Thing. And eventually, obviously, you know, pardon the expression, but it had babies, had babies, had babies, and those babies sort of spread out, and some of them were born slightly different, and maybe their differences made them more likely to survive, so they were more likely to have babies, and their babies were also slightly different. So that's a very, very short way of saying that these things like evolved and changed. So eventually, these living things, they went off and they evolved and changed to the point where we could say that some of them were plants, some of them were fungi and some of them were animals. So if you go back in time to our great, 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 great grandparents, um, they were like, we're all related. Plants and fungi and animals, all related. 1% of your DNA in your body right now is the same as the DNA of a fruit. Anyway, so these animals evolved and changed, evolved and changed, and eventually some of them evolved to have backbones. So we'll put them all in a separate category now. 
The ones with backbones evolved and changed, evolved and changed, some of them started giving milk to their young, so we call them mammals, and then mammals evolved and changed, evolved and changed. I didn't know this. There's three different kinds of mammals on like the evolutionary tree. Most mammals uh, evolved to give birth to live young, so that's, that would be humans, we're on that branch. But some mammals evolved to raise their young in pouches, you know, your marsupials, your kangaroos, and some mammals evolved to lay eggs. That's why everyone's very confused about the duck-billed platypus. There's only three types of mammal that do that, the duck-billed platypus and some echidnas, like spiny anteaters. So, yeah, we're all mammals, but slightly different kinds of mammals. We've evolved and changed in different directions. So that's humans. What ammonites did, do you remember this part, where I said that animals evolved and changed and some of them had backbones? There's 31 branches of this evolutionary tree. The, the little, these branches here are called phylum. There's 31 different cut branches here. And here's one of them. One of the branches was for animals that had, I'm gonna say a certain kind of nerve. I'm sorry, I'm gonna leave it there. I'm not gonna make it too complicated, but all the animals that didn't have backbones, but did have this certain kind of nerve, we call them mollusks. Mollusks evolved and changed, evolved and changed. And eventually some of these mollusks had at least eight arms. Do you know what we call those? Cephalopods, you heard that word? So all cephalopods are mollusks, yeah? There's different kinds of mollusks. Some of them have got at least eight arms and we call them cephalopods. The cephalopods evolved to change, evolved to change. Until eventually some cephalopods became squids and octopuses. Some cephalopods became nautiluses and some cephalopods became what a lot of people call ammonites, ammonites but are technically ammonoids. So you might have heard of nautiluses because they're still alive. I'm going to show you a picture of one. I can't believe this thing is alive. You would think that it was a picture, a beautiful picture um, of an ammonite that someone had painted, but allegedly this is a photo from an aquarium in Singapore of um, a nautilus. There you go, look, that thing's alive. So nautiluses look very similar to ammonites, um, but actually ammonites are more closely related to octopus and squid. So we don't think that ammonites had all these tentacles. We think ammonites, I think we think they had fewer. Um, but yeah, obviously, on the face of it, very similar. So that's a nautilus. So this is why they're different. It, you can't see on here because I've made it too simple, but ammonites, more closely related to squids and octopuses than nautiluses, but yeah, these guys are still alive, as are squids and octopuses. So the ammonoids, this is as heavy as it gets on theory of science, okay? Stay with me, we're not, we're not gonna be long. I'm gonna show you some really nice photos in a minute. The ammonoids evolve and change, evolve and change. Some of them become ammonites, what we call the true ammonites, but some of them become serotites, and some of them become these things called goniotites. And really the only way you can tell the difference between these things is their pseudolines. Do you remember me telling you about pseudolines at the beginning and how we were going to come back to them? They've all got different pseudolines. So the Goniotites, so these things are all related. Goniotites, serotites, and ammonites are all related in the same way that we're related to, like the duckbill platypus or the kangaroo, okay? They're different kinds of the same branch. So goniotites are the oldest ones. They're older than the Triassic period. Super old, <laughs> before the dinosaurs, let's put them there. There we go. And they've got these very distinctive zigzaggy suitor lines. I will show you a picture. Thank you, University of Cambridge, Earth Sciences Department. So this is an actual photo of a goniotite. I think most of us would have said it was an ammonite, but no, now we know it's a goniotite. So this is the actual thing. You can see the suture lines, can't you? This is where the wall of the, where the septum met the wall of the shell, yeah? They've done us a beautiful diagram here, so we can see them much more easily. So gonotites, zigzag lines and if we scroll down it's a great website here we go can you see that they're in the phylum mollusk so goniotites are mollusks and they're cephalopods and they're from the subclass ammonodidia <clears throat> but their order is basically gonotype there we go and that's the legal stuff thanks there we go so the next one is the serotite right so if that's like the duck-billed platypus version of an ammonite then this is the serotite and their sutra lines 
are nice and curvy. There you go, look. Totally different. <laughs> I feel so foolish that I've been making this mistake in calling them all ammonites. These ones were only uh, around in the Triassic period. Only the Triassic period. There you go, let's put them there. I'll show you a nice picture of them as well. Oh, this is, I can't believe this thing exists in life. Look, look how beautiful that is. So you can see the suture lines are really curvy. Gorgeous. And if we go down, we get the lovely diagram as well. Oh, it's so nice. Look, you're the age where you could still go to university and get a job drawing these things if you wanted to. And look, so you can see it's still a mollusk and it's a cephalopod and it's from the same subclass that I can't say, uh, but the order is different. It's a ceratite and it was around, see, in the Triassic period, okay? So one more. Ammonites, they are, look at them, they're just amazing. They're just, I don't know, how do you explain that? Super wiggly, the ammonites are super wiggly and they existed after the Triassic period. So ammonites were around when the dinosaurs were around and then they go extinct. I think, I don't know if they lasted a tiny little bit longer than the dinosaurs, but basically after the Cretaceous period, we have zero, no more ammonites. Um, yeah, so the ammonites last for a much longer period of time than the other animals, I think. And they get much bigger as well. If you ever see a shell in a museum, like two, three meter big ammonite, it is an ammonite. I'll show you an ammonite. Here we are. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, you can definitely see them, can't you? So clearly. So diagram, and here's the description. Yeah, there you go. So from the Cretaceous period, much younger and there you go, the order's the same, see? And so I got myself in a right pickle in this first lesson, but I've come up with a way of remembering them. Um, the goniotite, the goniotite ha begins with a G and it's got a zigzaggy suture line. That's what I'm gonna go with. Goniotite begins with a G and its lines are all zigzaggy. And the serotite starts with a curly cur and it's, Suter lines are very curvy and wavy. That's that's what I'm going with. You can do your own thing. Ammonites are the coolest. And their suter lines are also very cool. I don't know. Whatever makes it stick in your head. Do you have to remember this? Is it ever going to come up again? I don't know. No. It's just interesting, isn't it? Right. I think that's the end of the lesson. Apart from, obviously, the most important bit, which is where you get to answer the summary questions or challenge yourself with the geology GCSE questions. But very quickly, before we do that, um, I will tell you how I'm doing these lessons for free because I'm not getting any funding. Um, I could be teaching quite small groups on Zoom um, and making a living that way, but actually I'm finding that this really works. I mean, there's no comments on this one, but in general, I feel like I get as much feedback from you and my relationship with you is as good as if I could see teeny tiny picture on the screen. It also means you're not having to target your backgrounds and stuff, but it does mean that I have to make money a different way. So most people who watch these are paying me at five or six, sometimes more if they can afford it, pounds per month and signing up to my coffee page. I'll write it down for you. So if you go to my Facebook page or you look around on my YouTube channel, you'll find this link to this website called Coffee, uh, where you can support me with a very small amount of money and I will send you awesome stuff. This is a good thing that enough people are supporting. I reckon I'm going to be grow this, going to be able to grow this to the point where you can get good science lessons for five pounds, six pounds a month, but I also get paid. I think it's going to work. And to say thank you, I'm going to send you Theatre of Science magazine. Ah. Oh, I'm very proud of it, it takes me ages. It's kind of like writing you a letter, I love it. So this times comes out about every two months. My supporters are very, very patient, understanding people, on average, every two months. This is the latest one on pirates. Um, so it's all about the science of pirates. Did they have wooden legs? Wouldn't that chafe? There's a cartoon which my fabulous husband uh, illustrates and designs and I write it. This one is all about, are there any good pirates? It's about two modern organizations that are working to save whales. Uh, which one do you agree with? Do you agree with both? You can decide. I send you a free piece of string what? so that you can do this knot activity at the back then to tie some knots. Um, there's good activities in it that I can't do on my page for whatever reason. Uh, yeah, I'm very proud of it. And if for the first time you sign up, I also send you some rainbow glasses because they're amazing. They make you see rainbows. The hidden rainbows that are all around us. And I also send you a description of how they work because how things work is the best bit. So that's pretty good, isn't it? For five pounds, I'll send you my little bundle of nice things and then you can cancel at any time. 
add ends. Thank you, supporters, for seeing through that. Right, let's get these GCC questions on, shall we? Here we are. So yes, usually I put up IGCSE questions at this point because that's what most home editors will be doing. But there's no rock cycle on the any IGCSE syllabus. So this is from a genuine um, geology GCSE page, which I found quite intimidating actually. Here we go. Right. Uh, so the summary questions first. These are the questions that I would actually like you to be able to answer by the end of this lesson. That would let me know that I've taught a good lesson and that you've been listening. So could you explain what the law of superposition tells us about layers of rock, please? And index fossils help us name rocks. Can you give two reasons why ammonites make good index fossils? Two reasons, please, why ammonites make good index fossils. More if you like. And the GCSE questions. <clears throat> The diagrams show details of three fossils. Here we are. So first of all, so we've got three fossils here. One's from the Triassic period and has got quite curvy lines. One's from the Jurassic period. It's got very complicated lines on it. And one's from the Carboniferous period and has what look like zigzag lines. <clears throat> um, which group of living things do all these fossils belong to? Are they all trilobites, all reptiles, all cephalopods or all corals? Question two. What is the name of those lines? They've been labelled K. What is the name of the lines uh, labelled K on all those fossils? Is it the suter line, the stem, the eye or the scepter? Question three. What is just a memory game? I'm so sorry for just testing your memories. It's very poor teaching. Which fossil is a goniotite? And give a reason for your answer. Which fossil is a g -g -g goniotite? Give a reason for your answer. Two marks for that. And question four, I would say this is the important one, really. Fossils, all of these fossils, A, B and C, are good index fossils used for dating rocks. So can you name three characteristics, three things about the fossil, which makes them good index fossils? I'm going to go back to my Facebook page and see what you've all been saying. Because Oscar, Leon and Yumi are, are giving me some good stuff here. Maisie, oh that's nice. Hey Maisie's new everyone. Welcome to the Science Alliance Maisie. That's what these people call themselves. <laughs> these people. That's what everyone who watches these lessons calls themselves. The Science Alliance. It's good isn't it? Welcome. They're so friendly. If you were on Facebook they'd all be saying hi, hi, welcome. So I'll say that for you. Oh no way, send me a photo. Nice. Yes. Oh look at this. This is some good note making here. Fabulous. Well done, Maisie. Oh, it's so nice being able to see you, thanks. Luke, I hope Palmer's okay. Assuming that Palmer's the dog. Luke might be the dog. Palmer, I hope Luke's okay. Uh, do, 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 do. Hello, Lucy. Oh, that's good, thank you. Oh, hi, Stormy. Oh, oh two cats. Wow. All right, they're cute. It's like a running joke on Theatre Science that I don't like pets, but they are very cute. Oh, well done. Uh, Yumi and crew. Yes, you're quite right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Tiger's a cat. I hadn't seen the photo. Oh, I see. Is there another photo? <laughs> oh, I'm just getting those cat pictures. This is good. Oh, hello, Abda. Hello. Sneaking in. Well, I say sneaking in. 20 minutes ago. Sorry, I didn't see that. Okay. How are you getting on? Hmm? I, I totally blanked out there. I've been in a vortex just staring at cat pictures. I don't know if three seconds has gone by or 20 minutes. Uh, okay, I'll give you 20 more teacher seconds. That means just as long as I like really. As long as it takes me to eat this last mouthful of cereal. Okay, let's do this. Oh, she says that. I better pull up the answers, haven't I? 
because it's the thing with GCSE questions, you can't guess the answers, it's very specifically worded. Okay, <clears throat> so question number one, very well done. If you said, like I know at least three of you did, cephalopods, all these are cephalopods. Remember, so, because that's the branch that they followed on the tree of evolution. So all ammonites are cephalopods and they're also all mollusks, yeah? <clears throat> uh, the name of the feature, I gave you a massive clue because I said it was a line. It, yes, it is the sutra line, well done. So the scepter is the thing kind of inside the shell, sectioning out the shells, but the sutra line is the bit on the outside. Which fossil is a gonia type, but it's the one with the zigzags? So it is C. And the reason, well, you could have said zigzag suture lines, and that would have got you a mark. It's good, isn't it? Zigzag suture lines. Um, if you're really good at remembering that time period, and you'd said that um, the Carboniferous period, Carboniferous was when they existed, that would have also got you a mark. Um, and here we go. Fossils A, B and C are good index fossils. So name three things about this fossil which makes it a good index fossil. Um, I'm reading the mark scheme now. So the, well, what they've written, I'll give you exactly, is rapidly evolving. Rapidly evolving. I'll give you a mark if you've said evolving fast or evolved quickly. Because they, So they kept changing, yeah? Um, easily recognisable. That'll get you a mark. Easy to recognise. Yeah. Uh, abundant. Abundant got you a mark. They only have written abundance, but I think if you've said, well, I don't know, I suppose lots of them does mean a slightly different thing, doesn't it? Lots of them might just mean that they're all in a pile somewhere. I'm going to give you a mark if you said lots of them, but abundance is a great word. Uh, global distribution is what they've said. I'm going to put found worldwide. Found worldwide, so they're all over the place. Found worldwide, uh, then they've got hard parts as well. So if you said any of those three, then you get a mark, well done. Cool. <clears throat> um, make a note of that one, tell you. There we go. At the end. Um, explain what the law of superposition tells us about layers of rock. <laughs> um, the oldest ones are on the bottom. I'm going to write it in Yorkshire. Oldest ones on the bottom. Or you could have said youngest ones on top. And two reasons why ammonites make good index fossils. Uh, well, we wrote them all there, didn't we? So any of those two, you could have said. Well then, we didn't put existed for a long time, did we? I suppose... I don't know why they didn't say that. I would have thought, but they didn't give us a mark at GCSE, so I guess I'm not going to add it in, just in case. Although it's a nice mark scheme, it does say if the examiner thinks that your answer is good, then you should get a mark, even if it's not in the mark scheme, which they don't always say. Right, um, that's your lesson. Yeah. I'm just going to flip you around and say cheerio. After one final nose blow. I'll hang on for a... Uh, it's on YouTube, isn't it? So you can always come back if you didn't get the answers. Quite sort of simple answers today. It's nice. <coughs> Hello. Um, so, yeah. Ammonites. They're absolutely brilliant. I read an interview with a scientist who she quite often got sent to date, like, dinosaur bones. And she said it was always so exciting if you were going to date an ichthyosaur skeleton, you know, like the kind of sort of dinosaur dolphins that lived in the sea. Um, she said it was really exciting if you were trying to work out how old it was and you find an ammonite nearby. She's like, yes, hooray, it's like a gift because suddenly you know how old it is to the nearest kind of 200,000 years. Um, oh yeah, the other thing I thought that was quite interesting is nautiluses and ammonites existed at the same time, very, very similar. Why did the nautiluses survive? How did they survive this horrendous extinction that ended the ammonites and they reckon the answer is it's as simple as the ammonites lived at the top of the ocean and nautiluses lived lower down in the ocean and 
uh, when this huge extinction event occurred, like lots of volcanoes going off and um, lots of dust in the sky and basically the planet got very, very hot, which meant that the oceans got very acidic. I won't go into the details, but the oceans got very acidic and most of that was happening in the top layer of the oceans. So the Nautiluses were okay because they were far down below, but the Ammonites all went extinct. There you go, Ammonites, Nautiluses, not one better than the other, just Ammonites, sorry, just luck. You chose the wrong bit of the ocean to live in. Uh, yeah, right, I think that is every single interesting fact that I learned about Ammonites for this lesson. Next lesson, oh yeah, we're gonna do igneous rocks. I think I'm gonna get you to bring flour and water and a, a sort of bit of paper we can turn into a straw and we're gonna blow and found, find out how igneous rocks are made. Yeah, and this weekend, Obviously, you might not be watching this live, but the next show I'm doing with the Lego Storytime is about rainforests. So that's on Saturday morning or Monday evening next week. Thank you so much for coming. It's been an absolute pleasure. I'll see you soon. Bye.